Congratulations on your time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Ed, okay. Ed won a race, Farhan. I don't know if you knew. Well, let's. Uh, we're we're on the air now. Uh, this okay. is a uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good good in between wherever you are on this fast forward planet, which is not just wrapped, wrapped still in a pandemic. Remember, only uh, about three billion out of close to eight billion of us have um, been vaccinated, and now, of course, we have the. Uh, epic disruption from the uh, invasion of Ukraine by um, Vladimir Putin and his cronies. And th that could still play out in ways that are completely um, scary, depending on several things that go forward. I did a session on that last week. I'll be doing more. It's an overheating planet, um, as yet another IPCC round has um, reinforced. Uh, the vulnerability is... Uh, not evenly distributed, something I've been writing about for a very long time. And the challenge and opportunity in building a better relationship with the climate system, which is I think what we want in the end, is both urgent and, and, and possible, but it requires a lot of work and a lot of redesign and a lot of uh, facilitation of connectivity between and among disciplines and communities in ways that we haven't really succeeded at yet. I'm really thrilled to have uh, three guests on so far. I th hopefully, Lisa Shipper, if she's not completely collapsed, will come on from Oxford. Um, uh, we have here Ed Carr, Clark University, a, um, who's, who's uh, one of the uh, authors of a key section of the report on climate resilient development. And we have uh, Ben Arlov, my friend and colleague from Columbia University, who's who launched the, the Glacier Hub blog here, among so many other things he has done uh, is at the interface of community geography uh, and risk. And Dr. Farhana Sultana from Syracuse University, who has popped in just because I love what she does in the public space on making sure we don't forget the wider dimensions of the issues that we all work on. And you'll learn a, a bit more about her in a second. Let, let's just start with a brief, for those who haven't met any of you, we'll start with a brief, uh, just a quick hello. Like, how did you become who you are so far? And let, let's start with Farhana because I haven't had you on here before. Uh, Ben's been on and Ed's been on, so you're you're new to this this adventure. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Andy, for um, inviting me. This is literally uh, come join us in ten minutes. <laughs> so I know, this sorry. is me <laughs> knowing about this from ten minutes ago, but been quite kind of caught up at a different conference that I'm attending, uh, which is the uh, American Association of Geographers annual conference that um, Ed knows quite a bit about, um, and then also following along and trying to spread the message of what the IPCC report is doing. But um, just to uh, very briefly introduce myself, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Geography and the Environment at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. And I've worked for a very long time on issues around climate and development, climate adaptation, uh, gender and climate change, um, and climate justice uh, on a global scale. And I'm happy to be here. Uh, just a caveat, I'm not one of the authors who was up for weeks and months, but I am one of the commentators on it. But I, I think the experts who have read uh, a lot and written a lot um, in this panel today are um, Ed and Ben. Um, I'm, I'm happy to add my bits. That's wonderful. Uh, great. And I want you back because the issues you work on are, are, are I've dug in on here before and uh, the, you know, finding ways to, to really fully engage uh, across these barriers, uh, both race, gender, life experience, uh, geography. I, I still can't believe that Columbia, is it true Columbia killed its geography department 20 years ago, Ben? Yes. You know, what the fuck, excuse me, what the F is the, the that? Geography matters. I should, I think I've used it as a hashtag, you know, so um, uh, just bleep out what I said a second ago. I didn't fully say it. But, <laughs> um, so Ed, Ed maybe you, uh, you just a, a thumbnail sketch of your skills and your role in the report. Sure, sure. I, I'm Ed Carr. I'm a professor and director of international development, community and environment up at Clark University. I'm also uh, on the uh, scientific and technical advisory panel to the Global Environment Facility, where I'm the adaptation panel member. Uh, I was one of the lead authors for Chapter 18, as Andy said, which was titled Climate Resilient Development Pathways. So that's been my role in this report. Great. And Ben? So I'm Ben Orlov, and I'm an anthropologist, teach in the School of International and Public Affairs here at Columbia. I was 
uh, lead author uh, previously on the IPCC special report on oceans in the cryosphere, drawing on my interest in mountain areas and have been working on uh, chapter 17, the chapter that precedes Ed's. Th that's the decision-making chapter that's really focused on concrete actions often in the short run and Ed provides the longer term, bigger picture and very important to have both of those in the report. Yeah, for sure. And this issue that, that Farhana started with, uh, justice, um, is very much a component of this, both the decision process, how do you widen the decision process so that it, it is, is not creating maladaptation, one of Lisa Shipper's specialties, if she gets on here, and, and walling off people from, from uh, uh, resilience instead of fostering it across dimensions. Uh, and what, what, like, what I'll, are I'll just interrupt, uh, yeah, Andy, and say that one of the questions that often comes up with IPCC reports is, "What's new? You've been telling us this for thirty years." That's that say, is yes, one have, question. It's not our fault that you haven't fixed it. Uh, we <laughs> just, but in fact, we're not just trying to slice and dice the same material and perhaps change percentages by small amounts. Justice is really one of the new features here. That is a. Uh, major introduction in right. this special report and that obviously comes from the wider society as well as the academic community but it also really points to the way that if we're all living on a very leaky ship we can't just worry about people on the lower decks we're all going down unless we fix this ship so it's really a powerful message yeah i, th I think that's true and there was a lot more from what i read uh, there was significant indigenous community presence as um sort of uh, vetting some of the chapters and, and co-writing some parts too. I, I Absolutely. Uh, my chapter, we have had direct participation with uh, indigenous contributing authors and another major feature, but I see you have here. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back on a little time trip here. Um, my 1988 global warming story, uh, actually, you know, it was mostly about the CO2 problem, but the headline writer kind of got this right. <laughs> global warming has begun and we had better start preparing for the dramatic changes to come, 1988, the, that was published uh, October that year, which is right, I think the same month the IPCC was chartered. Um, and then um, this in 2002, after I got to the New York Times, this was the first piece I did. I, you, know, you know, I was hearing more and more in my reporting at the climate treaty talks and stuff that this, this word adaptation was being seen as a dirty word. Yeah. There was a lot of concern about you know, the moral hazard and I, you know, began writing about it then, and I haven't stopped because I really feel it's an underappreciated reality that these two things have to happen. You can't downplay either. And for Hannah, just as an outside, outside the IPCC process, but in these issues, what's been your sense of, you know, are people, can we get over this? Or, or is, it, is it correct to have this dual track approach? You know, what do you think? Um, I think there's a reason why it occurred this way in terms of uh, multiple tracks, but primarily two. And I know it can seem confusing because these different reports come out at different times. Um, but I think it is in a way important because you need to have enough space, right? And you need to have bring together different authors and um, experts to be able to have these conversations. Otherwise, it can become really overwhelming rather quickly. I mean, that's my um, sense as somebody who's not been tasked with being an author, but often a reviewer or a commentator or a discussant, um, but often doing the work of the media spread, right, and the educating part, um, but also the critique in terms of, well, in what ways do is it important to have these reports, but um, what more can we say? So, for instance, the report that um, was released today, yesterday, <laughs> I forgot time zones, um, you know, in terms of really clarifying discussions around, for instance, maladaptation that have been happening amongst, for instance, geographers and other critical social sciences, but for it to have made, you know, uh, made its way into a global uh, report is important, but also nuancing discussions around resilience, because that's been so overused. Um, at the same time, bringing in different voices, thinking through justice. I mean, that's such a normative concept, right? And it so becomes so contentious of negotiations, you know, which kind of justice are we talking about recognition, you know, <laughs> distribution, reparative, I mean, all the different uh, right. procedural. So um, I think it's these reports do important work in terms of the thing, the, the reports doing the work, right, of 
all the work that's gone into it. But it, it speaks to uh, audiences, people who need to hear, but it also gives journalists, um, students, activists, things that are more manageable in bite-sized pieces that they can work in with. Um, so, you know, as somebody who's kind of very close to the process, but not fully inside, I mean, that's kind of my um, external. <coughs> I, I would yeah, say and that gets to this. Sorry, I'm just going to say this the issue of narrative. Who owns the narrative? What is the narrative? There's a big fight always. And I think that's been some of the resistance to the adaptation, uh, whether you call it resilience, whether you call it capacity, to, uh, uh, adaptive capacity. Uh, you know, there's such a focus on the failure and cutting emissions. that I think many of my friends who are climate hawks are really carbon hawks. They're not like climate risk hawks. <laughs> I, I wish we had more of that risk reduction part in the foreground. And then we could all get together on emissions have to be reduced and risk on the ground has to be reduced. I don't know. So, so I ben. want to jump in if because there is one important point of connection. This I'm in the point of what's new here, and I don't mean to say that, oh, it's all brand new. I mean, this is the product of long work from many people. Sure. Uh, many, many people are involved. But Andy, you're asking about the question of mitigation, reducing the emissions, and then the adaptation, coping with the impacts, the risks that we're seeing now and in the future. And what this report does is to group risks by systems. So I don't mean to get lost in lingo here, but if we really want to get to a climate resilient development, which we do if we want to have a sustainable world, we're going to, we're going to need to have a transformation that's going to change uh, how we relate to ecosystems, change our food systems, change our energy, change our cities. And so more than before, this report says, here are the risk responses over here, and here's how effective they are. And we're grouping them by which systems they contribute to transitioning. And those system transitions together form the whole transformation. So rather than just saying, we're, do, we're spot fixing a lot of problems, coral reefs over here, fires over there, epidemics right. over there, and we're going to fix them. We're saying these are all contributing to, trans, to the changing our systems, the ones that interface with the planet, and that brings the two together. So I'm glad to see that here. It's a major step forward in this report. I, I love it. And Ed, that gets to your chapter, I think, very much. I was reading through it. Although, you know, this is the challenge, right? Um, I saw Alex Steffen, who's sort of a systems thinker on Twitter, kind of pulling, resisting the report's message. And I, w I just tweeted to him, Alex, this is exactly what you work for. It's, it's a systems approach. But there, but there isn't a, like a bite-sized nugget that a journalist can kind of turn into a headline. You know, I, in fact, when I wrote my piece about it today, I said, this is hard. It, it does take like more than a paragraph or two. <laughs> And I don't know whether that, what does that feel like for you, Ed? If you could just talk a little bit about that resilient, climate resilient development idea. And then I want to ask each of you about the role of academia, because that's where we all are mostly at. Sure. Um, first of all, Andy, what, what you just said, I think is it kind of gets it dead on. You're not, you're not going to write this in a sentence or a paragraph and make sense out of it, because adaptation sort of defies that. It is locally specific, but it's not just locally specific, it's, it's specific to the people involved in that place. And those people are differentiated in a lot of different ways. And so anytime you start talking about it in really sweeping ways, you're likely overlooking some of the challenges people face and possible solutions that might work for them. Um, though I will say that the whole purpose of the concept of climate resilient development is to highlight the fact that the action needed at this point is concerted efforts on adaptation to reduce risk, but real deep cuts to emissions to kind of mitigate future drivers, all lined up with actions that can lead us towards sustainable development goals and achieving those. And sustainable development goals, I think we often cast them as goals for other people, at least those of us living in the global north. But that's not what we mean here, because there are sustainable development goals to be achieved everywhere, including within totally. the United States, a country with really substantial inequality challenges that, again, stem from a whole set of causes. And if we're going to address those challenges here, just as people are going to address their de development challenges in other places, it is going to be through systems thinking that pulls all of this together. Right. You know, when way, way more than a decade ago at the New York Times, when I was doing my blog, Earth, I wrote a piece called, Do the Top Billion Need New Goals? 
<laughs> and it was it, that was the time of the Millennium Development Goals. It was before the SDGs, and it absolutely was correct, especially when you're thinking systemically. And I hope maybe what we're seeing here is a shift. And now, and I do want to ask you about academia because, at least at, at Columbia, as Ben knows, you know, we're trying to build a climate school that crosses disciplinary lines, that integrates with community needs and that heads toward outcomes. And all of those things are disincentivized at the university, not, not by intention, but by architecture and history. So what, what do you feel, maybe uh, Farhana, then Ben, and then, and then Ed, getting back to you, what does academia need to do to be more useful in this approach? Um, that's a great question. This is something that I think many of us who are kind of critical scholars, but also very applied and embedded within the communities that we work is something we, we grapple with a lot in terms of how do we make interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary academic work really resonate, have, um, you know, kind of value and valence uh, with powers that be. Um, and, you know, disciplines are... Um, man-made, and I use the word man-made intentionally because they were made by men for a very long time, uh, but a long time ago uh, for men. Um, and then, you know, it started to kind of widen and then shift and diversify. But at the same time, I think we are seeing kind of different types of generational shifts and different programs that are rising, different kinds of work that's being done, the kind of cross-fertilization that's occurring. And this is why, I mean, I switched into geography in graduate school because it was the one discipline that allowed me to combine my background in the hard natural sciences and earth sciences, right? Um, somebody who's gonna go on to be an oceanographer and a climate scientist, but shift and take that into learning. Oh, now I need to learn you know, feminist theory because it's yeah. affecting women of the world differently. And I can't explain it until I read and study more. I mean, I think those, those are the kinds of discoveries a lot of our students undergo, but you're right. The institutional structures don't necessarily make it easy in terms of funding, supporting uh, de um, departments uh, you know, equally, but then also in terms of um, uh, reward, uh, promotion, uh, recruitment of faculty, retainment, fa retaining faculty, promoting and celebrating faculty, supporting different kinds of research. So as we're seeing in the IPCC report that came out um, just now, the importance of understanding the complexities of vulnerability, of systems thinking, of understanding what justice means, right? These are things that we do in the critical social sciences um, much better than other disciplines. Um, and yet it, people use those words without necessarily having the epistemological or theoretical background and training that would really help them be bolstered in their argumentation. And, and I think those are this is where people are beginning to recognize. And we're seeing that with a lot more with climate scientists who are saying, this is not my area of expertise. I'm going to defer to somebody else. And that is a form of decolonizing of academia that's slowly shifting. Like how to seed a space right to yeah. silence oneself so other people can be heard yes uh, that's something uh we all have to work at one one thing i've been trying to do with this program the sustain what show is to host what i call friendly takeovers where i literally literally leave the room i've had <laughs> students um at several levels come on and do their own shows so I'm, the more the more that the better um and it's hard sometimes um this this I wonder if the word, you know, the word decolonialization is in this report. I don't know if that's a first for an IPCC report, Ben or, or, or Ed. Oh, yeah. I'm almost certain it's never been used before in an IPCC report. I have to go back and word search it, but I'd be shocked right. if it's shown up before. And, Cer and certainly, more pres certainly more visible. If it was there sure. at all, it would have been talked yeah. about. And maladaptation is not a new concept at all, but, but uh, it seems to be getting more elevated. I, if you do, a, I, I have done a word count for maladaptation and its first appearance is quite early, but it's more extensive now. And I think in the, in the early days, it was more simplistic too. you know, uh, there's many instances in disaster risk, uh, like uh, levee construction along the, the Mississippi River, uh, just simply shielded communities in one place and sent the water elsewhere. But now there's more, more dimensions to what's called maladaptation. I think it's not just physical. And yeah. Okay. Well, and that, you know, that's absolutely right, Andy. And, you know, that builds out of work 
that's been going on for a long time. So conceptual and empirical work from people like Farhana um, engaged in applied work that you know I've been doing with my lab alongside development agencies and slowly building up a greater and greater empirical base to show that actually maladaptation plays out in much smaller and more complex ways than we thought. It's not just displacing the hazard onto a whole other population. Sometimes you can actually take a very adaptive action that works great for one part of a population while disenfranchising another part of the population. Okay. And it's very difficult to think of that as adaptive. But that kind of nuance required both those conceptual arguments and the growing evidence base. And uh, that has really accelerated, I think, over the last 10 or so years. So it's not terribly surprising to see it getting picked up more and more now in this particular uh, particular cycle of the assessment report. And one thing that I've written quite a bit about is the uh, is the the fundamental reality of an adaptation gap. Whether you whether you're thinking about spending, whether you're thinking about policy, you know, historically, this report does show uh, somewhere. I was looking for the number. I saw it the first day. I was looking through the um, embargo of materials, and I couldn't find it again. It was like ninety percent of effort is in the mitigation of mission side. I can't remember what it alluded to money or whatever, but clearly this is huge uh, imbalance. And to me, when you think about the temporal aspects of the climate problem, you know, emissions mitigation gives you no benefit on the ground anywhere for decades. You know, Mike, Mike Mann and others are trying to argue that if we stopped emissions now, warming would stop. Yes, for sure, but we're not gonna stop emissions now. <laughs> The world is not uh, like a, an instant stop start thing. Um, so that means um, you have these profound effects playing out. And, uh, but so you there know, is the, the imbalance the, just seems to me absurd. The mitigation reports going to be coming out. The working group theory is coming out quite soon. And uh, I don't, uh, we will see what they say, but it seems likely that there'll be discussion actually that mitigation brings other benefits that we transition. The just transition to a green economy is not like, oh, we miss our fossil fuel, but we had to give it up. We're, we're happy with the new systems. There are many other advantages. It, it can be. But, uh, you know, again, I, after COP26, my big article there, I, I really dug in on the emerging concerns in sub-Saharan Africa for being cut off from financing for uh, new oil and gas development, which, yeah, if you're looking at a high level and you want to end fossil fuels globally, you would say no more fossil fuel funding. If you look on the ground in Nairobi, where, where I've been, where lower middle class working families are burning charcoal for their supper in the, you know, the informal settlements around Nairobi, and you realize what the issues are there, talk about a systems problem. Well, that, I, a I, propane could actually, you know, LPG is, is a I, I just want to, I, I believe that's uh, a perfect segue. Ed, don't you have a Kenya case in your chapter that refutes yeah. that? Well, but we have a Kenya case, but doesn't we don't wade too deep. You know, we because of working group three coming out, we, we stayed uh, away from wading too far into the mitigation space. Uh, one of the things actually I'm really interested in seeing coming out of working group three is how they address what Andy's talking about right now. Because there is no question, right? I mean, human beings emit, we do it in a lot of different ways, land conversions, another way in which we're uh, emitting greenhouse gases. But then we're getting into questions of relative responsibility, relative impact, and not responsibility for what's happening now, but also responsibility for how we ended up in the circumstances we're in now. And that's a very, very complicated thing to assess. For that sure. said, working group three is going to need to assess that not to assign blame or tell policymakers what to do, but to create the most accurate possible understanding of what's come up to inform the policy conversations. So uh, I think that you're dealing with something, Andy, that's important, but it does slide a little bit past what we could do in working group two, even in chapter 18. So, so yeah, although could, but oh, this did come up in it, you know, I've been talking about there, there's an adaptation, there is an adaptation advantage to having significant access to energy. You, you, the adaptation advantage is uh, in cold places, families in Mongolia can avoid uh, choking on coal smoke, but maybe going to propane is a heater in the winter and or people in sub-Saharan Africa or rural India can justifiably in India, you know, as Kirk Smith said for many decades, 
uh, a subsidy a subsidy for propane is the best possible use of a bad fossil fuel. And so it's like that gives them more adaptive capacity to have that clean cooking fuel. Well, but what you're speaking to there, Andy, is the fact that when we talk about climate resilient development pathways, we're talking there are there is no first of all, they're not prescriptive. It, this is not something where uh, the IPCC wrote a report and said, follow these steps and you will become climate resilient because that that's not possible. Right. The second thing is they're locally specific. I mean, we're talking down to potentially like watershed or even community. For levels sure. Yeah. About that. And I think that that's just really important for everybody to remember. It could mean in some circumstances that what you're talking about in terms of adaptive capacity and energy use at a certain scale does yeah. make sense. However, we have to be very careful to make sure people understand that makes sense in that particular context. It does not free everyone up from thinking about that because in other contexts, particularly here, for example, in the United States, we have tremendous capacity. Oh, to make, totally. Yeah. And we have tons of resource. And so, you know, again, it comes down to who's responsible, who can have the biggest impact on the overall picture as well as their local picture, and how do you best do that? Um, and that really then gets us back to, again, what you were talking about earlier. That's why I think the focus on things like equity, like justice, like inclusion have become so important in these reports. You can't even identify what a problem is unless you've made sure that the right people are in the room. And historically, we haven't necessarily done that. Then we start talking about solutions and we still don't have the right people in the room. And so again, if we're going to talk about these pathways and understanding these sort of systemic interrelationships between mitigation, adaptation, and development in particular places, we're going to really have to think about who gets to participate in those conversations. And we have to do a lot better than we have done up to this point. For sure. And that takes us back to Farhana's um, universe. Yes. So what what do you see as the action points here, Farhana, to get to really build that kind of kind of inclusion in, in a way that is results in richer decision-making. Right, so this kind of, um, to link it back to my prior comment on what decolonizing academia means, it is about um, increasing those um, equity considerations and justice um, considerations. Um, but in, for the IPCC or the UNFCC um, and these reports and then the various ways that they're, they're um, taken up by governments and other bodies, um, for instance, the World Bank and its financing and so on, is how do you change narratives? And I think this is where the IPCC has done a remarkable job this year in terms of shifting narratives a little bit. There's only so much it can do given that there is inertia, right? It's a global body. There has to be consensus. Yeah. This is all volunteer labor. Um, so just the fact that it's volunteer labor is one of the um, systemic points of uh, exclusion, because who can volunteer to give that kind of time up? You know, if you're a scholar from the global south, you may not have funding that um, ha um, ha lets you have free time to participate in the IPCC. The government may not pay for your job, right. and you may be holding down two or three different teaching jobs to be able to, um, you know, just maintain um, a livelihood or support your family. So, you know, there are all, all kinds of structures in place. Um, but at the same time, it is, as Ed rightly pointed out, it is about like making space, like demanding certain things. So if somebody can't be there, how do we still include their voice? So certain uh, like journalistic reports came out last year in terms of what does greater um, diversity in IPCC personnel mean for the kinds of outcomes and results. So therefore, the knowledge base, so the types of knowledges that get included, the types of argumentation, the different voices that are then elevated. And I think these kinds of issues um, are being taken seriously the people who are very committed to the IPCC are very, you know, passionate about these things. Uh, there are obviously structural systemic problems that, that make it harder to do, in my opinion. Yeah, you're um, reminding me. I, I think you were involved in this discussion of the Reuters hot list. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yes, I was. Um, and the the Africa, there was the conversation <laughs> published. Yeah. Through. The, the Reuters hot list of most cited scientists, right? How, who gets cited, whose knowledge counts, um, yeah, you know, whether yeah. I say something that will be valuable versus if exactly what I said is also said by Ben, it has the same level of value or you know, uptake, right? These are the yeah. structural barriers that we're talking about, whether it's intersectionally gendered, racialized, classed, um, also geopolitical location. Are you a member of 
um, an academic university? Are you somebody in this country or another country, right? So there are all these like kind of social power structures that come into play. But I think this is where some really important work is being done within and outside the IPCC in terms of making these critiques known. And these critiques are then start to shift, right? Narratives in yeah. reporting, in terms of, um, you know, uh, the personnel involved in report writing, in terms of who is surveyed. Um, you know, like I got asked by the Pulitzer Center on Climate and Jour Journalism on their funding and, and some of their work. Um, it's I don't work necessarily on journalism, but right. I had important things to say. And I think they found that very useful. So, you know, those kinds of issues are coming up. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll just briefly ask you about social media. You know, I, I never would have met you personally, you know, without Twitter. Um, everyone seems to be running away horrified from social media, but I think you all are <laughs> practitioners. And I have consistently found it as a journalist, especially Twitter, um, as an invaluable place to uh, get, you can get constructive feedback amid all the trolling and stuff. And and you can so widen your lens on issues by, yeah. if you poke, if you have a, an interrogatory approach and not an expository approach. Too many journalists are just, you know, <laughs> spouting. So anyway, I, I, I don't know if you feel the same way. I think I mean, that, you know, social media, especially Twitter, I'm thinking about it 10 years ago and I'm thinking about it now. And it's not the same place. Uh, 10 years ago, I found Twitter to be this amazing place because you know if you picked and chose your way through who you were following, um, you could develop this community of folks who are reading more widely than any one human being could, who point right. you to stuff. And like you said, you could get really great feedback from folks. Um, and now it is increasingly difficult to manage a feed so that that's what comes through. And yeah. you do find yourself really picking your way through. I mean, I'm currently waiting for my mentions to implode on Twitter because, you know, I've shown up in the New York Times and a few other things today saying, you know, what do you know? Climate change is real, pretty severe, and we ought to do something about it. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to get nuked at some point by people because that's what they do. And yeah. it's hard at this point because, you know, there's nothing to engage with in that situation, right? It's not like there's a face and a person and an actual conversation to be had, which I think is really important. And I'll talk to anybody if they'll talk. If you're right. just going to like throw bombs at me from some anonymous account on Twitter with an egg, like I, I'm not terribly interested in you. Yeah. And, and I think it's hard to filter through all of that. And I'll speak for some of my colleagues here and Farhan and Ben, you probably know folks in the same situation who just don't have the energy for it. And, and I should point out, here I am, um, I'm a middle-aged white guy getting stuff thrown at him. Uh, I know the kind of stuff that shows up on Farhana's feed because I follow Farhana and therefore I get to see this stuff. Farhana gets all kinds of vitriol that doesn't get aimed at me. So I can only imagine the levels up for some of our colleagues. And this goes back to Farhana's point about the barriers, right? Who's visible and who isn't. Some right. of this is because some people catch a giant pile of crap on social media and yeah. they don't feel like digging out from under it all the time. And all of a sudden they become invisible. So uh, I'm, I'm, it used to be enabling, but I do think it can be disappearing now too. I, I'm thinking about this question of visibility and whose voice counts. And uh, Twitter certainly is one space for that, but to bring it back to the IPCC and actually referencing back that question of academia, one of the steps that the IPCC has taken and may not it is a significant step is it has moved from only drawing on academic literature, that if something had not yeah. been published in a peer reviewed journal, which pretty much means in English, then it doesn't exist. And the IPCC has really moved forward to say, if we're committed to bringing forward indigenous, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, if we're serious about full transparency to civil society organizations, then we need to draw on a wider body of literature. And the IPCC has actually been willing to listen most distinctly to indigenous people, some with local communities that are saying, we have our own ways of documenting our knowledge and right. here's where you can look. And so I'm thinking of, uh, oh, in, in the ecosystem chapter, or early on in, in this new report, there is a, a case study uh, developed by a con contributing author from Peru on indigenous knowledge in the Andes on how indigenous farmers are coping with decreasing water availability uh, because of Glacier Retreat and how they're also faced with challenges for mining companies that just want to take over what water there is and pollute it. So it's really integrating their, the indigenous vision 
that it's not just climate change, that it's a whole ongoing colonization, a right. series of the display, the dispossession that began with the Spanish conquest is continuing to the present. Those right. are voices that come forward from indigenous peoples. I'm not saying that the IPCC is perfect, but I have to say it's a great relief to see cases like that, that and to, to, that they've been approved by 195 countries yeah. is really. Yeah, step. that 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 approval process has also been criticized in the past. But when I talked to some of the early framers of the IPCC itself, uh, Alan Hecht, it, like decades ago, the buy-in there, having countries sign off, gives it that sort of formal formal assignation and confirmation that we're we're part of this. It makes it harder for them to uh, pull back. And the compromise is sometimes they're they can be very counterproductive in terms of language choice. There were just well, some fights today, uh, I mean, yesterday over geoengineering, which I'm not even sure why that's in this report, but it is, um, and uh, a couple of other. Uh, I, I love the way there's this whole question of how they talk about loss and damage. That's oh, right. A concept that's really come forward from the from the global south, the, the small island states that are saying, uh, mitig worse, you can't mitigate fast enough and we can't adapt fast enough we're disappearing beneath the waves and you can't just tell us you'll buy us a farm someplace else <laughs> where we live is who we are and so there's that phrase loss and damage and then people were saying no 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 that's a political concept so you can't discuss that and the ipcc developed was able to say well we're talking about lowercase losses of l and lowercase d damages sure we can talk about i that. i i was wondering if that conversion to, to to plural was a way to disengage from the formal loss and damage concept is that is well, losses that's and the, damages. That's a way to have them coexist and uh what th that is what was approved what we what we can talk about is what's been approved right and so i think it's again these voices from below and these are justice claims these are very much just oh, very claims. much so and you can get controversial stuff in if you're assessing the literature. I mean, that's the key point. And so small L loss, small D damage, absolutely everywhere in the literature. It's very clear that exists. Sure. And so if we frame it around the lit and we stay away from that larger political context, then yes, it's going to go in and it's very hard to contest that data. But I do think it's incredibly important for everyone to remember the IPCC reports are in the end political documents. That's why they exist. They are the shared set of facts that the climate negotiations rest on. That's why you have to have this document get negotiated by 195 countries and you need to have them sign off. Right. Because if they don't, then you don't have a shared basis in fact for any conversation about climate action going forward in the world. So everyone, I hear people kind of come at us and say, oh, I can't believe this was negotiated. I can't believe governments got to review this and intervene in it. But the fact is we exist, at least in this context, in this document, to inform those governments and their processes. And if we don't get them signed in, they won't accept these facts. And then climate negotiations go absolutely nowhere because people can just right. argue from their own facts. And that's crazy. I, I think actually there's wonderful larger lessons in this process, you know, having been at, covering it since its genesis. Uh, I wish there was an intergovernmental panel for global risk, period. And then we would have had a better preparatory sense of uh, pandemic risk, for example. This, that process doesn't exist in these other arenas or just conflict, intergovernmental panel on global conflict. I, I talk a lot and have had several sessions here on peace building, which is, which is not just the absence of war. And peace is way beyond the absence of war, as, as some of our colleagues at Columbia and elsewhere really are digging in on. But if we're not having a global conversation that generates sort of a common frame and insulates it from some of these more purely partisan approaches, I think um, we're, we're missing an opportunity. So the IPCC model, for all its faults, and I've written a lot about the faults, I think is a, it's a great thing. Yeah, this report does talk about conflict a bit more than other reports, perhaps not as extensively. It does when it it has several things. It focuses on climate change as a risk multiplier. It's quite confident in saying that that there rarely do you say, "Oh, there was a drought and then there was a war." That's right. very hard to say. But you see many areas that are politically and socially fragile that have weak institutions, poor governance that's where the climate impacts exacerbate conflict. And well, they, again, it's the literature. So yeah. I, 
Although, so Farhana, probably... one, one last thought from you, and then I'm going to have to cut this one a little short because our septic tank is being pumped. <laughs> Speaking of sustainability, and uh, I've got to uh, go make sure that all works out uh, correctly. <laughs> um, inflows, outflows, balance, <laughs> avoiding overflow. That's what we're talking about here. But if, uh, you know, what we, if we if we did a further session like this, um, digging in a little bit more on on your uh, your world, Dr. Sultana, what would you? Uh, where do we go from here with this? What's the next step? Uh, wow. <laughs> so if I had a, a magic wand, right? What would we talk about? Well, I think kind of uh, using the latest report um, as a launching pad in the fact that climate justice was so central to uh, this report. Um, as Ben was saying that, yes, there are a lot of indigenous voices that were brought in. There are a lot of different forms of diversity of knowledge, recognizing the different losses and damages that have been talked about for a very long time. So for instance, uh, my work is um, from Bangladesh, and you know, Bangladesh has been talking about climate change since the 1980s right. uh, for a very long time. And in terms of research generation, but didn't always make it out. Um, it's it's making it out much more widely. So I think a further conversation would be able. How do what does justice look like? What does um, in terms of uh, it look like on the ground? Like for instance, can we talk about issues like um, you know gender justice being important to climate justice? Yes, we can. But at the right. same time, what do we mean by hyperconsumption and the runaway system that's creating the problem. So therefore we need to address those those other factors that are making people more vulnerable over time because it's compounding vulnerability, right? So issues around degrowth, about decarbonization, but also when we talk about justice and equity, it is about being, being very central and being very clear about who are the people we're talking about and not to, but the, who are we talking with? Right. And I think this is what's really important to center voices that are otherwise um, really not always heard. And I think this is where the IPCC is a political document, and I agree with Ed, and it does important work. And, and I absolutely hope people really read it with care instead of just having apocalyptic narratives. Because right. the apocalypse has arrived for a lot of us already. We need to figure out how to not just have it in the future, but recognize the past and the present of it. I, I love that idea and getting past just the labels and stuff. Well, thank you all for being here. I, I do have to cut things short now and um, we'll get at this again. And everyone get some rest because there's a long <laughs> journey ahead still. This is a, absolutely this thank challenge you. Is a, an epic one. Thank you again. This is the Columbia Climate School Thanks. Sustain What webcast signing thank off you. to go fix, make sure things are okay with my own systems. Thank <laughs> you, Andy. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.